have to change your like this is an unclear benefit precisely because supporting green products doesn't exactly mean that you shift those the shift the incentives of individuals or you shift the incentives of companies to change their production lines precisely because they bank on the idea that unsustainable products are cheaper and more economical for individuals thus comparatively it is only when we bring these products or the fact of overconsumption being harmful into light where we call out the fact that they're overproducing where we call out the fact that the consumption for example of these unsustainable products is the very harm that exists on the ground that is when they are compelled to lean out their production precisely because that's the attitude to, of uh, environmental groups for example so that is when they produce less products and only produce the ones for example that are necessary by consume for example by, by consumption of individuals but next is the saturation of green products is still harmful this is because of three important reasons one Often, these green products are expensive and these individuals, especially in developing countries, cannot meaningfully opt into, for example, green products in the long term. It is unclear whether or not your support will make the production cost cheaper. In fact, we see that it's not. This is precisely because they're much more expensive to produce than renewables or for, uh, than like single-use plastics. Second, they are, so they might still be more sustainable, but the fact is they're still not bought, they're still overproduced, and they still become waste precisely because no one buys them. This is the core problem that exists on the ground, and this is the very same reason why we're still doing damage, or why we're still doing damage, because precisely because we're not utilizing the green products that still exist. But lastly, is these are reasons, right, why the damage that we create and the damage that these companies create are still damaged. The tieback is. Why should this then be the option of the movement and why this is the more strategic choice for movements to exist on the ground? This is because it is the very consumption and it is the very over it is the overconsumption of individuals that is the most impactful uh, the most impactful issue that exists upon this uh, upon this motion, right? It is when we call, for example, companies to produce less, and it is when we call individuals to consume less, do we get to shift the macro scales, for example, to reverse the damage, especially when we want to meet our goals towards sustainability on the ground. But second, this is the more economic choice that we can compel among individuals. We can't tell poor people to make better choices. We can tell them to consume less and make better decisions by not buying and opting into the machinery of capitalism war. This is the more appropriate course of action, especially for an environmental movement that cares about impact, that cares about change. It is only an OG. You hear, I thank the Prime Minister for that speech. To begin the case for the opening opposition, I welcome the Leader of Opposition. Hear, hear. One moment. Um, am I audible? Yep. Great, I'm just going to set up a timer and have a sip of water. <clears throat> uh, POIs in chat. Opening opposition have a simple and elegant two-pronged strategy to win this debate. First, we'll explain that anti-consumerism is incredibly unpersuasive and is only increasingly so. Comparatively, green products are likely to convince more people to buy into the environmental movement, which means pound for pound, the environmental movement achieves more environmental change for their advocacy. This is especially important because in the environmental movement has other demands than just convincing people what they should do about consumer products. For instance, they're trying to convince governments to do a renewable energy transition, which means they require the highest level of buy-in possible. Secondly, we'll set aside the question of the persuasiveness and buy-in that this messaging attracts and just evaluate a world where anti-consumerism actually takes hold and succeeds. We will suggest this is a bad idea because it causes an economic downturn that forecloses governments from having the capacity to do expensive environmental transitions, which ultimately is deleterious. By contrast, green products have desirable positive externalities that do not carry, uh, carry the same harms. Let's get into that first argument then. It is unpersuasive to argue for anti-consumerism because it requires you to essentially persuade people to buy less consumer products in general. It, it requires you to, for instance, say you should use your heater less. You should turn off your air conditioner more. Uh, you should, for instance, not have a heater or an air conditioner. You should have less stuff, essentially. 
is is the claim that anti-consumerism makes people. And, and essentially, I would suggest that for the vast majority of people that the environmental movement is seeking to appeal to, this is too great of a personal sacrifice to countenance. For a set of people, it is an essentially impossible demand. You're being asked by the environmental movement to use your heater less, to use your air conditioner less because they are pollutants. But uh, no, I can't do that because it's hot or it's really, really cold where I live and I have to have a heater. Anti-consumerism for those people is simply unpersuasive. But even if you're capable of that, it often, it can, like buying consumer products is often seen as an integral part of the way people form their identity. For instance, how people buy clothes is often seen as how they express their sexual or gender identity, uh, which is very integral to people's understanding of themselves, which makes convincing people to do less of that very difficult. And opening government, weirdly enough, in this debate suggests that there is a trend towards fast fashion, which unfortunately goes directly against the intuitions of their own case, which is since the 1960s and the hippie movement it has only become less persuasive to people that they should do buy less stuff and have less stuff, the overall trend of the economy, the overall trend of people's preferences is clearly aligned with, I want lots of stuff. I want that stuff to be cheap and readily accessible so I can have lots of it, which clearly aligns with a, anti, a pro-consumerist preference, which makes this messaging pretty hard to convince people of. But even if that weren't the case, it's very vulnerable to co-optation that makes it seem pretty unpersuasive. Like for instance, it's pretty easy to be like, the environmental movement is so unreasonable. They want you to not have a heater when it's cold in the European winter. They're placing, you know, all these unreasonable demands on you how can you listen to them whatever uh which is much, much more difficult when the demand is like you should buy like the green the thing with the green tick on it rather than the one that doesn't have the green tick on it uh i would also suggest this attracts the ire of the general business community rather than just the ire of businesses in a specific sector because the target of anti-consumerism is buying all less products less because all products are bad all products are environmentally damaging which requires you to take as opening government does a highly anti-business message where politicians and the general business community are highly likely to oppose you which means they have the incentive to misrepresent you far more and they have the incentive to spend money on discrediting your messaging far more which makes this an unpersuasive message comparatively Arguing for green products is far more persuasive. First, because it has a positive framing, it's good to use these products versus scolding people for using a bad product, which is what they are have to support. But also, I think it's easily co-opted by businesses comparatively because it is relatively low cost to use a different packaging, which impacts ecosystems and eventually adds up to impacting ecosystems quite profoundly. Uh, but it is far less when the message is, no matter what you do to your product, no matter what, you are contributing to environmental harm because you are creating a product. Uh, you have the incentive for businesses to work with you. And I think the environmental movement probably would work with businesses, which would mean businesses would get on side with environmental messaging or more. But I would suggest the easier rhetoric is just like, uh, you should give, uh, you should swap things rather than you should give things up, which is why it's very hard to convince people to diet by just restricting all their calories, eating lots of boring food, but it's much easier to convince people to, for instance, swap out a high sugar alternative for a thing that tastes just as good, but maybe has less sugar or a meat alternative versus a just eating vegetables. That makes it a far easier piece of rhetoric to persuade people is actually valuable. The impact of this debate is actually enormous, I think. Environmental movements broadly in the world lack capital. They broadly struggle to convince people to get along with their priorities, which means that Every, anything that you could that this government bench does to diminish their persuasiveness to people, to diminish the buy into the general environmental movement, is a bad thing. Honestly, it means that they achieve far less, even if it's a good idea, which we'll later refute, that it is that to, to make people buy less stuff, they don't achieve that. They don't persuade people of that. By contrast, we do persuade people to use green products. And that is the change in this debate. Because the environmental movement pursues other environmental goals. It has other advocacy priorities. For instance, convincing governments to do a renewable energy transition, which is a far harder priority, requires a very powerful environmental movement that is well-funded, that is well-bought into, that is is politically popular that is entirely foreclosed by the arguments of the government bench they should not do it i'll take a cgpi now at best all of your benefits are tokenistic co-opted corporate social co corporate social responsibility how does that actually change the ways in which consumption is ruining the environment um you have to get past the barrier that you're not going to convince people to do degrowth 
uh, if you if that is really your POI. But like changing packaging so that same single use plastics, which pollute water supplies, don't get into water supplies, actually has a pretty profound impact on like ecosystem collapse, which does in the end impact climate change like i actually think that even if it doesn't seem very sexy it is ultimately an impact that matters briefly anti-consumerism is bad because it will cause an economic recession if it actually happens because people will be buying so few products that businesses will not be able to retain employees because they won't have enough influx of cash uh, people won't have enough influx of cash because they're losing their jobs which will cause an economic contraction because people will just stop spending i recall sierra beat me in an australia's pre-quarter about degrowth about a year ago proving the exact argument that they are now about to refute uh the economy is ultimately not a ser an, an irrelevant right-wing concern environmental spending is incredibly costly it requires you to do new infrastructure to upgrade your facilities to capture carbon rather than for instance not doing that doing lots of research and how to best environmentally transition an economic recession seems like a very inhospitable environment for that economic transition to happen it seems an un unlikely world where the environmental movement could have any purchase with the rest of the broader community for that reason anti-consumerism is bad even even if it succeeded, uh, proud, to, proud to oppose. If you're here, I thank the Leader of Opposition for that speech. To end the case for the opening government, I welcome DPM. You're here. Hi. Um, hello. I'll take the oyster voice. <clears throat> I'll start in three, two, one. I think I'd like to clarify what this debate is actually about. Because it's not a debate where government just have to defend a world where green products do not exist and that it's all, all about anti-consumerism and no one can produce anything at all. That's just weird and extreme. We say that it's about where we prioritize and what we have to prioritize first as a strategy in order to meet the goals of the motion of, of, of the, the environmental movement. And that is to suggest that on our side, while we prioritize anti-consumerism first, it does not fiat that in the long run we cannot transition towards green products or that there will be no creation of green products at all. What we say, in fact, is that when you advocate for anti-consumerism first, it creates a large demand for companies to actually try and uh, accommodate the creation of better products, which means that it is unlikely for us to not have products at all in the long run. So what this debate is about is not about whether there is an absence of green products or not, and that the company, all of the world just fails because there is no production, but whether as to what force actually tries, to, uh, what force do we actually try to prioritize in order to meet the goal that you know, we just save the environment, etc. Let's first clarify and weigh, uh, let's first try to weigh whether this can be perceived well. The main brunt of your analysis is that this is bad because it always they, uh, goes towards in direct opposition towards how you form your identity because a lot of people buy in order for them to form who they are. I think this is just asserted, right? Often, a lot of people buy less because they understand that their identity is often independent of what they buy. But even if this is true, right? We say that the trends of anti-consumerism that we see comes as well in, together with a lot of trends of the progressive of like this of progressive movements things such as minimalism things like as you saying things uh, sayings that you only buy what sparks you joy. I think these are things that also tries and create identities. So it is unclear as to why identities are absent on our side. In fact, we say that the formation of identity on our side likely becomes better precisely because now you only do not you do not have to spend so much things. You do not have to spend or, or reformulate your identity over and over again just because of the pressure of consumerism. We say that it's likely to be the quality is likely to be better, that you feel more satisfied with yourself when you have less stuff, precisely because you know that this stuff is likely to be good, likely to be responsible as well. So notice that at the end of that, it is unclear whether the uh, formation of identity is absent on our side. We say that it's likely to be better on ours. The second thing that they say is that it's going to be expensive, and a lot of governments would, and a lot of governments and companies would not want this. The problem here is again, it is asserted as to why, in the long run, we cannot have any green products at all. We say that we're likely to going to 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 have it, right? But even in the worst instances, where a lot of governments and companies probably think that this is unpersuasive, precisely because it's anti business, we think we're likely to able to trade this off. Because what we want to convince are not the companies and the governments, rather, but are the public can actually opt in to have the lesser demand in order to convince the companies and in order to convince the, the companies and government to actually do better in the long run. What we say is that we're likely to, even if we're not able to get immediately the uh, decision of companies and governments, we're likely getting the public first uh, anyways, which is good. And this is, again, reinforced by the fact that there are a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of, um, ideologies right now that shape 
people to become more responsible with what they buy. And they are mindful precisely because it's expensive because they understand that there are repercussions when you buy a lot of products, which suggests that it's likely that a lot of people are going to perceive this well. So in the best case, right, that people prioritize green products, I think that it will still lead to a lot of dire consequences because companies still have the incentive to fabricate, fabricate demand and advertise pervasively. And this is me like attacking the model. The consequence is that if a lot of people still do not understand consumerism, and, and that is, and it is likely that there's going to still be overproduction of green products because they still need to have a lot of demand, precisely because the public demands that there should be more and more and more products. We say that this will still create carbon. This will still create a lot of harmful gases towards the um, environment. And this is something that is really bad, precisely because right now, right, um, the environment is extremely saturated by a lot of pollutants. That so any amount of like one zero zero point one percent of additional methane will likely collapse the ozone layer or something like that. We say that that's extremely detrimental. What we say even is that, uh, what well, what we say even is that. We think that the attempts to anti anti consumerism is likely to be perceived is likely to be better precisely because absent consumerism, it is easy for other activities of the movement to be effective. Things such as tech that claims up oceans, things such as creating more green products in the long run, precisely because now uh, people understand that you can, they have to be responsible with the choices that they have to make, and they can consume less in order for like to not produce a lot of like pollutants in a, a, a lot of pollutants but secondly right it also makes the the uh, technology and development effective in cleaning up a lot of things precisely because on their side if there's a lot of green products that is continue, continuously being overproduced and you're trying to clean up oceans it is still a fact that there's still a lot of waste going towards this ocean precisely because you still are creating a lot of more products which means that it's a, it's it's a net zero game on their side right you don't clean oceans and you just create more products in the guys that probably it's 50% less carbon, but it doesn't mean that it's ultimately less car uh, no carbon at all. We say, therefore, that it's better that we have anti-consumerism insofar as we limit the amount of products that we, we limit the amount of products that the public use and therefore incentivize a lot of these companies in government in the long run that perhaps you're, uh, they're angry right now that in the long run are able to create more or tangibly more good products um, in order to cater towards like uh, profit, etc. Sure. Why has fast fashion become much more popular in the last 10 years? Um, I don't think it is popular in the last 10 years. I think a lot of times fast fashion has been boycotted a lot. So for example, if you look at Shine, if you look at H&M that uses a lot of child labor, when people understand that there are a lot of uh, country, a lot of like environmental damages by fast fashion, often they do boycott it precisely because people understand the consequences of, uh, you know, these things. So it's unlikely to be true. But even if it's, but um, the second thing is that for companies and government, um, I think here the problem is that in either side, they are unlikely to try and do uh, and to try to try and do environmentalism um, good, right? Because on their side, companies can still greenwash, can they say they can still create products, put a green sticker on it, and that's good, or that they can overproduce these green products and therefore create carbon. So, and it's unlikely for both uh, for any in, in houses to convince companies and government. But what the value that we're trying to forward here is that when you are able to capture the public, which is already can be convinced precisely because of the trends that goes uh, because of the trends that uh, is happening right now. It's likely easier for us to try and ease the government and companies to try and uh, to 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 become more environmental in the future. So again, it is unlikely for us to just not have products at all. This is is this very uncharitable of opening opposition to argue propose. Here, here. Thank you, DPM, for that speech. To end off the opening half, I welcome Diallo. Here, here. Just checking on Audible. Yep. Starting in three, two, 
one. First thing I'm going to ask in this debate is just how do we think this debate works, both in relation to the trends that OG talks about and about the ability of this movement to make change. Then we'll talk about how advocacy works and why ours is simply more successful. Then I'll have a new extension about the ease of government regulation. Then I'm going to explain why uh, degrowth and, and other anti-consumer theories are actively bad for the, government, for the environment. And then I'll prove why they're bad for the environment and unpopular. And then finally, I'll re-whip the content about popularity, which is incredibly poorly responded to and clearly wins the debate. Because even if you think the government bench is capable of proving that you only you, like we only get marginal changes in the amount of green products that are required if like 10 times more people buy into it that is sufficient for us to win the debate and the very poor responses from uh, that previous speech means they don't really respond to our claim well how do i think this debate works and the first question i'm just going to ask is where do i think this debate uh da -da 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 -da. Oh, cool. It's like, how do we, where do we think this debate actually takes place? Because the Prime Minister uh, kind of alludes to a series of claims around persuading people in the developing world. And while I'd love to have this debate in this context, it's just not the most important one for two reasons. The first is the environmental movement is obviously more powerful in the developed world because it's been thinking about this issue for longer. And honestly, the response that the, uh, these, this movement gets in the developing world, which is, hey, maybe we should care about our poor people first, then the environment is pretty persuasive, which means the movement's pretty weak. And the second is to explain that the overconsumption that they talk about just is pretty Pretty rare in the developing world like obviously there's still rich people in the developing world that consume too much but the average person doesn't consume an awful lot more than their bare means which means when you tell them to consume less they do so in poor ways or they simply can't reduce it by much but in comparison someone like myself in the developed world does over consume a comparative amount more which means you can get more change there but also i am capable of buying the slightly more expensive product but the person who is otherwise comparatively poor either doesn't have access to that product or is unwilling to buy it so there's very little delta and change in the developing world so we have to talk about the well. Second thing I'm going to talk about here is just around the trends. OG is like, well, we're already doing enough green products. If this previous speaker thinks that you greenwash products, then you need the movement to call out greenwashing. You can't do it if you're focused on telling people they shouldn't buy fucking aluminium foil or they shouldn't buy a new jacket or they should turn off their heater or something like that. So obviously this is more uh, unpersuasive. But we also explained that anti-consumerism just historically was somewhat popular and is now way less popular because it's a movement that's been associated in people's common uh, interest with hippieism and that is not very popular anymore. Let's explain how our advocacy works. And the simple comparison and framing here I'm going to talk about is we just act on more important, powerful actors in the world. Because unfortunately for OG, we explain that the environmental movement doesn't have infinite social capital and they have other things they want to do, which means they can't just convince everyone's mind by talking to everyone. In fact, they probably should not argue against powerful actors, which will probably own them in pu public discourse. We probably shouldn't argue against progressive or centre-right governments because they still want the economy to continue. We probably shouldn't argue against businesses who obviously the average person does believe in capitalism and does believe in buying nice things and looking after themselves and maybe debaters don't because we're a bunch of progressive weirdos but obviously the average person is totally fine with capitalism we act on more powerful actors in the world which probably leads us nicely into my quick extension here which is on the ease of government regulation when you attempt to regulate something in a government, say, for instance, the ban on plastic bags, which kind of swept across the world in the last like five, 10 years, that is something that obviously the opposition to it is a set of businesses. And if businesses already have pre-existing products, which means they simply would have to shift from their default product, as PM de describes, to their green product, that's a relatively uncontroversial decision for them. They might still do a bit of lobbying, but they won't really bother too hard. And it's not a really big difference, which actually does mean governments can do things like ban plastic bags, they can do shifts towards EV, they can ban combustion cars in their cities. Those are useful polit policies. They are things that improve the environment. And we think they're much easier to achieve and businesses don't oppose them nearly as much. Okay, let's then talk about the question about which one of these two policies gets more change if, say, one individual changes their behavior. The first thing I'm going to point out here is the anti-consumerist message is for the trend reasons we already identify and don't get responded to is a pretty hard message to explain. That is, it has to be anti-capitalist. It has to hulk back to hippiest ideas and is incredibly attacked by conservative views. And let's concede that you are then able to convince people that consumerism is bad. It just means the political capital we have to explain what they should do instead is comparatively hard. And each individual has lots of varying dif different situations. So it's very hard to tell someone what they should do in some situation. And that would lead to a situation like the one Oscar and I happened to be talking about yesterday, about this old idea of Earth Hour, where we turn off the lights for an hour and we think we'd be doing good for the environment. This was fucking bad shit, because you know what the average person did? They turned off their lights and then burned 
candles or they stopped using their heater and they used a log fire, which is just way worse for the environment. And I think average people making these decisions all the time is probably pretty bad. The second is they're likely to do things like not replace an old car with an EV because it's like, oh, I better not buy a new thing, consume a car. But obviously that thing is like 20 years old and awful to the environment and putting out so much CO2. And the final thing is maybe in their best case scenario, this is about doing things like growing your own foods and having a veggie patch. But those things are horrifically inefficient because you use bad resources, you use bad things like nitrates or other fertilizers, which means you're not particularly efficient anyway, and we probably use, should, should use the economies of scale of large farming, which obviously is a pretty important, agriculture is a pretty important part of, of, of an economy and most importantly of the environment. CG, what's your POI? Presumably the capacity of these groups to call out greenwashing has increased at the point at which they're perceived as being neutral and not endorsing individual products. Like one, like obviously you can endorse a product and then critique another. It doesn't matter if you perceive it as particularly biased. Like I don't think anyone calls out the environmental movement to be like, you're in like the books of like this particular company of, of aluminium foil because you say that one's more recyclable than the other. Like this seems like a crazy mechanism. You have a lot of work to prove. This is actually convincing to the average person. Okay. The second claim what I'll make here is that this actually, that uh, these shifts in tactics are particularly good for the environment. And I'm not saying they're better than the standard, the standard product. I'm saying they're actively good for the environment. And that's because the biggest shift we're talking about here is things like packaging or like the construction of, say, a phone case or something like that, or any other sort of normal uh, tactile item, where we might shift from using a single-use plastic towards, uh, say, constructing something with paper or cardboard or bamboo. All sets of resources which are much better for the environment pro provide things like environments for animals to grow up in and just suck CO2 out of the environment. So anytime we make those shifts, not only are we making a product that's better for the environment, we make a product that's actively good for the environment and we should do just for itself, which is the way that we rebut this claim that OG continually says and asserts, which is you make too many metal straws. No, it's fine if you make too many pieces of wood. Obviously, that's just good for the environment. The second set of claims we have is this provides jobs, both because degrowth provides negative jobs because you have less consumerism, but also because you provide new jobs and new industries that say a shift towards something like hemp, which is a really good material that would replace lots of things in, say, construction. That provides new jobs, which means the governments co-opt this because it means that people are better off. Importantly, jobs and productivity and uh, wealth for people is important because it is the ability to burn or sorry, boil your water with electricity rather than wood that is the most important change in the environment using basic technology. And that only occurs if people are well off and are able to make those investments. This is definitely a more uh, a popular policy, but I don't even need to prove that because Oscar does, it wins this debate. I win the debate in the second way. Very clear, oh, I win. Here, here. Thank you for that speech. To begin the closing half of this debate, I welcome the member of government. Here, here. Am I visible and audible? Yep. Give me a second to just drink some water so I don't start coughing in the middle of my speech. Okay. Okay. Starting my speech in three, two, one. First, I'm going to do some framing and outframe the top half because I think they missed important uh, considerations about what this actually looks like. Secondly, I'm going to talk about why advocating for this is actively harmful for the environmental movement, answering like the question from OO that OG has not answered yet. Thirdly, I'm going to prove why the anti consumerist narrative is actually really uh, persuasive for these people, flipping the entirety of the OO case. Okay, firstly, talking about framing, I think what was missing the top half framing is like actual characterization of what the environmental movement can do. Notably here, the environmental movement is small, they lack political capital. I think the second thing to note here is, as OO concedes, like green products are already perceived quite positively by people in the developing world. It was deeply unclear to me, like by OO's characterization, why necessarily uh, the environmental movement needed to advocate for, the, uh, for like consuming these more, right? And a third thing to note here is that young voters especially are criticizing the environmental group for their incredible short-sightedness in like prioritizing advocacy for these movements, uh, for uh, these products, instead of like actually doing anything good. I think the fourth thing to note here, under framing as well, is that this, there already exist intrinsic incentives for corporations to make green products, just like in terms of advertising, ESG incentives for investors and all of that, those things. What does this mean then? This means that at the end of the day, there's very little delta of change, there's very 
unclear why environmental organizations would be the tipping point then for like huge amount of change. What matters then is how this organization centers itself to get broader policy changes and actual broad support, noting that we exist in an incredibly critical time when support for green products is already there, but support for like actual environmental policy is very low. Okay, firstly, um, just some extraneous responses to opposition before I get to like substantive material. They say that it's like incredibly unpersuasive um, because doing things like switching off your air conditioners is very unpersuasive. Like that was just deeply unclear to me. Like that's lowering, that's asking people to lower emissions, not engaging in anti-consumer stuff. Uh, but I'll actually integrate my response into that in terms of the anti-narrative stuff. Okay, firstly, why? I'm going to explain why this green movement advo actively advocating for environmental uh for green products is actively damaging to their movement. Noting here, the framing is that we think that green products are good as like all sides agree. But the problem is when you spend your time advocating, that's incredibly bad. I have about like six mechanisms on here. The first thing to note here is that green products use relative metrics to determine how green a product, product is. For example, like, oh, more recycled materials. But that thing is, it's incredibly, uh, hard to dis it's incredibly hard to discern that because it's up to the discretion of the companies and it's the fixed incentive of a company to exaggerate how unsustainable it is the second thing to note here is that this advocacy undermines the quality of the green products noting that like cur currently what this means is that they it already has a unique selling point because it's already perceived as something like analogous to like how novelty items are perceived as really good and stuff right because of the virtue signaling that surrounds buying green products and stuff right but what the environmental movement advocating for this does then therefore means like probably people buying more and more of them. I think the third thing to note here is that they're still very susceptible to the harms of consumerism, which is to say, like, you can use this to virtue signal to say, oh, look how good I am using this incentive to like bait the consumers. But more importantly here than all these previous mechanisms panel, and I want you to note is that what this the environmental movement advocating for this does is it means that activist investors and mutual funds that actually have like climate friendly incentives. Now, instead of using their funds to fund speculative technologies, they're much more likely to uh, fund like add like production of these green products, noting that the legitimacy they have only existed insofar as the environmental movement was actively advocating for this production in the first place. What does this mean then? This means that firstly, you've just got extra net consumption that offset like any greenness you could get, which is directly in against the incentives of the environmental movement. But I think the second thing to note here is that even if th there was existing green products in the market, as like pretty much OO concedes that people already do have incentive to buy this, you cause people to buy them more, leading to all this incredibly negative carbon damages. But I think the third an incredibly critical thing to note here, panel, is that this meant you gave capital to companies that were more likely to invest in ways that were incredibly bad for the environment. Noting that things like um, things like green products, um, are only t tend to be created by like large companies because creating a green product has huge overheads. At the point in which this company is like incredibly small margin of profit. This means that over time, not only will these products probably become worse, but the company is like more incentivized to uh, be incredibly propagandized over the market. That's probably incredibly harmful. Before I get into why, we're going to flip the entirety of the OO case. I'll take a POI from OO. As we explained, the environmental movement is necessary to raise information and awareness, to call out greenwashing and to convince more people. Clearly, there's a delta. The environmental movement can do that. You guys have to can advocate for why greenwashing is bad. Like. You guys had to explain why them advocating for green products necessarily had to come at the expense of anti-consumerism, which is now now I'm going to talk about why I'm going to flip the entirety of the OO case. Okay, I think the best thing you know here, OO says that it's incredibly difficult to explain because conservative backlash. Guys, what's the delta here? Conservatives are already against environmental friendly products in the first place. What we tell you is the real delta here is young voters, right? Young voters that currently right now are actually quite incredibly disillusioned with how, with how like weak the environmental movement is, right? Noting here that at the point, noting here the second thing to note here is that young voters being more are just factually more politically engaged but thirdly um thirdly they're very amenable to this like anti-consumerist narrative i'm unclear why oh just like gets up here and lies and says oh they're incredibly disillusioned i want to note that like as speaking from someone from that young generation like things like noting how you know inflation and wages haven't grown with wage inflation there's like this generation is probably like the most uh, pro-communist pro-socialist generation out of all previous generations i think they're quite amenable to this right okay i think what this means then is that under their side of the house when you prioritize advocating for green products what does it look like i mean it meant firstly you just made the environmental movement so much weaker because you created a narrative that this was about like oh you know city avocado vegans all that stuff i think the second thing to note here critically is you just get so much less political capital on their side of the house 
noting that as I alluded to in my introduction, young voters especially are thinking that the environmental movement is susceptible to corporate capture and all that all of those incredibly bad things. Under our side of the house now, when you're promoting this anti-consumerist narrative that is a lot more palatable, this means that uh, groups like workers' right groups or like labor movements or just like youth labor movements are much more willing to coalesce and put the power with yours. But thirdly and incredibly critically here to note as well, panel, is that not advocating for consumerism, uh, advocating for anti-consumerism rather, means you can integrate broad political criticism that challenge the demeaning narratives of capitalism, noting this is like directly responsive to all of O's case. That is to say, instead of like flipping the narrative that your worth is derived from what you can buy that like uh and it's like all these young children that go to school and they feel incredibly marginalized because they didn't have the right clothes or because they didn't have all that stuff right no this is a huge independent benefit because a problem with the perception of the environmental movement now is that it's perceived as uh perceived as like not being a view a group that has like rational views on the economy at the point in which you ex explicitly uh address all the fears and concerns of the young group of voters which are probably going to be the most salient in the because like the, the group that's going to perpetuate this in the future as well that was incredibly important for all those reasons we beg you to propose you're here thank you for that speech to uh, close off the golf bench. I welcome government whip. You're here. Hello, can I be heard? Yep. Thank you. Oh, sorry. This is Emma. Sorry. Huh? Uh, uh, nothing, nothing. Yeah. I was like, did I miss an entire speech? <laughs> Oh, wait, um, can I start or? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Oh, okay, 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 okay. sorry, sorry, I got it. A couple of years ago, there was an environmental NGO office near my grandmother's house. A month ago when I visited, it got shut down because corporate sponsor pulled out. The point that we're going to forward from closing opposition is really simple. Like if you don't have money, the movement cannot do anything. Money is a prerequisite for having access to the power to be able to lobby the government, to be able to advocate and launch any campaigns, or to be able to plan events in the local community and do environmental good, for example. So our claim is really simple. The first extension is going to be about why corporate support substantially reduces on the their side of the house. The second extension, we're going to be incredibly chatted with both government bench, even if people are going to buy into the narrative of anti-consumerism, why the impact of green products on the environment is greater than that of anti-consumerism. First, on corporate support. Under the status quo, or at least under our side of the house, when we advocate for green products, it is likely that many corporations are likely going to sponsor environmental uh, movement. Why is this the case? Firstly, note that the advocacy on green products are conducive to business interests because green products means essentially you create a new market out of thin air. Essentially, our existing market in most of the developed and mature economy is currently incredibly saturated. So for example, when it comes to cosmetic industry, if you are a new player on the market, there's no way that you can you know, like compete against the existing player that is a big company. By contrast, the way that you can go and break out of the saturated market is by modeling yourself as, and advertising yourself as green products as like uh, cosmetic products that have you know that uses for example recycled products for example because and the reason that is the case is that even if your product is a little bit more expensive and you don't have any previous brand and established company name people are still willing to do it because environmental movement is advocating for it and saying that this is a good thing. So if you are a moral person, you should buy it. That means that you create an economic incentive for many companies to opt into green products insofar as that is economically conducive to them. Secondly, note that the green products essentially generate greater profit margin because consumer care less about price and like uh, and quality of the products, right? Like people who purchase green products oftentimes tend to be environmentally conscious. They listen to environmental movement in developed countries. And what does it mean is that, you know, like they're not buying it because they love the product, but they buy this because you think that you're a morally good person for doing this. It is right decision for you to do it. That's why people buy this. So even if the product is marginally more expensive compared to the counterpart, people are still willing to purchase this, meaning that it is conducive to business interest to begin with. MG's response to this is that, ah, emphasis on corporate social responsibility and ESG investment exists. So everything's metric about corporation. No, it's not the case. You know why shareholders currently support ESG investment? Because it is conducive to business interest interest under the status quo. You cannot use today's example to say, make your case. Uh, that's why many example and many companies under the status quo opt into this and sponsor environmental movement. But how does this change 
under their side of the house. The advocacy of anti-consumerism is likely going to mean that many companies stop financing environmental movement for a couple of reasons. Reason one, many companies have already invested in green products that means that they've established supply chain, they've, uh, they've invested in things like research lab, factories, as well as advertisement campaigns already. They've spent millions of dollars doing this already as a way to invest onto the future speculative benefit of being able to capture the market in the future. The problem is that environmental movement now says, oh, fuck you, right? Like essentially says, oh, we're not going to buy any products and convince their followers in the main consumer side to instead try to not consume anything, which essentially means that the main consumer market is gone. They did a substantial amount of profits and they made all of that you know, investment already. They spent tremendous amount of money already, but they gain no return of absolutely under their side of the house, which means that the corporations are likely going to be specific repeats. They do not have capacity to be to finance it. They're going to be incredibly retaliatory against the environmental movement. But second, secondly, not that the negative, not that the, uh, the very advocacy of anti-consumerism in itself is a negative campaigning against your products, because essentially what he said is that environmental, you know, environmental movement essentially tells uh, shames for excessive com com consumption. This looks like telling people that buying stuff leads to environmental destruction. If you do not want to be complicit in the, the, the in end of human civilization, or if you do not want to be complicit in the rising sea level that kills many people in Pacific Islands, for example, you should not buy any products. It's, which essentially means that the very product that you sell is going to be tainted with the image of the destruction of the entire humanity and very bad environmental destruction, which means that this is a negative campaigning that reduced that, that is likely going to be seen as a hostile thing uh, in terms from the perspective of corporation. But the finally, we would suggest, uh, yeah, yeah, I just, I just go with that. Uh, that means that many corporations are likely going to stop sponsoring the environmental movement. What is the impact? On the daily scale, NGOs and many environmental groups, for example, need to pay rent for their own offices, pay for their workers, or event planning takes enormous amount of money. None of this is available if you get shut down. On the grand scale, we would suggest the environmental movement there's capacity to be able to launch advertisement and campaigning for myriads of other issues or alarming the issue with general environment in general, or things like lobbying government in developing countries to have a strict regulation on environment. None of this is possible if you do not have money. Weighing against opening up as well as closing up, which seems to rely the entire case on people's popularity and people's support for this movement. Note that the whether or not people are going to be convinced by advocacy of a movement entirely depends on people's interior world. Maybe opening government is right that many people are minimalist, in which case this advocacy is indeed going to be convincing on government bench. A lot of the impact of opening up as well as closing up on this clash it has to be speculative insofar as it depends on each individual's interior world whether or not they're going to be convinced, but corporations' generic claim is far stronger. Second extension, even if buying is symmetric, why is the impact of green product on environment greater than that of anti-consumerism? Firstly, and I know that this takes the best case scenario of government bench, even if people are con convinced of anti consumerism and people stop consuming a lot of the things why is it that it's not it's not going to have that much of an impact one know that anti-consumerism has huge amount of limits what it means is that as opening opposition said people still need to have access to heater in winter people need to have con air conditioner people need to have textbook in education and their classes for example what that means is that no matter how much environmental movement convinces people to stop consuming people have to consume a lot of the things on the day-to-day -day basis either because it's the necessity in life or something that you have to have in order to have a comfortable life what does this mean it means that the avenue for stopping consuming products is substantially smaller. By contrast, on the our side, the avenue for green product is immense. It's greater. It's everything, right? Like computers can also be green. Paper straw can be green. And things like cosmetic products can be green. Everything that you have in life and every product you consume on the day-to-day -day basis can be green. So even if green products have marginal impact compared to stop consuming altogether, the avenue of stopping consuming together is incredibly small. By contrast, the avenue for having green, the greener technology and greener product is substantially larger. Secondly, note that as time goes on, efficiency of recycling and reuse in green products improves substantially over time because more companies invest in green products and they, they have incentive to things like, do things like develop technology, for example. And the reason why this is the case is that because many companies have an incentive to just like invest into green tech, for example, it's out of order, by the way. Uh, and the reason that is important is because people who buy these products tend to be conscious about environment. So oftentimes there's things like green washing index where you can see which company is doing the best, which you can can see the quality of the environmental friendliness of the product. And that's why, for example, if you develop an 80% efficient recycling instead of 60%, you win against your competitor. It means you have an incentive to develop in, in improve upon the efficiency of your own products. That means green products create substantial differences. We take the best case. Corporation matters. Money is important. I'm sorry I have to say this, but very proud to stand on a closing opposition. Here, thank you for that speech. To close off, to close off the government, I welcome the government whip. Here, here.
five kilos and chop, please. The problem with opposition bench in this debate is it relies on entirely absurd and absolutist characterizations of how this narrative actually manifests. Because it wasn't true what OO told you that this narrative manifested in telling people to freeze to death in their homes. It similarly wasn't true that we were going to tell people to use archaic forms of technology and take like a horse and carriage to work because you couldn't buy a car. I think that in actuality, what this narrative looked like was criticizing the types of profiteering and the types of excess consumerism that was engendered and conjured by companies. Those were things like planned obsolescence by Apple at the point at which they went and told you to buy their newest product, even if it wasn't materially different from their last. That was the point at which they went and told you that buying this thing was a signal of your virtue, was a signal of how good you were, was something that you needed to compete with. That was the narrative that we were actually targeting. I think that had Opening Hub identified a more reasonable conception that some of they would have like gotten over the deadlock of characterization that exists there, but independently we exist above that fray because Amanda is able to come up and tell you the reasons why we independently engender legitimacy within these groups, why we are able to get you broad popular support with with other coalitions of leftist movements and why we are able to just have more material net less emissions that was an independent benefit probably stood us above in this debate i'm going to do three things in this speech first i'm going to deal with the extension that comes out at co second i'm going to talk about the oh okay and the harms of economic downturns and being and having backlash Last, i'm just going to weigh out political capital and who gets more of it and then i'm just going to like whip our extension and tell you why it is incredibly debate winning on the first point about the co extension the first thing i'd like to note here is the way in which it is almost entirely mechanistically derivative of their opening like serious Seriously, very, very derivative because their opening comes up and tells you that companies have more capital or that these organizations have more capital with which to do things with which like advocate for like greater uh, policies that are more tangible and material. We think they similarly just come out and impact more harms with that. Uh, but anyway, let's deal with what this extension actually says. They tell you that firstly, more companies are likely to opt into doing green technology. Uh, sure, that wasn't a good thing. That was what's being contested. Likely the form of that was going to be very tokenistic corporate social responsibility that like pandered to things in certain interests, but wasn't actually materially good. Note the ways in which Alman milk is actually quite bad for the environment in some instances in the sense that it is very water intensive. Note the ways in which you could like obscure the metrics of which you measured how green something was by comparing it to past products in a way that doesn't actually tell me a lot about the tangible environmental sustainability of a product. This thing has 10% less plastic than before. I don't know how much plastic it had before. The second thing to note though is that it is oftentimes only big companies that do this and this deletes the part of their extension about now new companies get to come up and have an incentive to enter into these markets. Note was specifically because the margins in which you had to like operate green technology were necessarily lower. You had competition incentives to have a more competitive product and to like lower down your price, but note the fact that the margins therefore, because you had higher operational costs by virtue of having to be green, meant that you probably didn't have a huge incentive to enter into this market, meaning that it was already established companies that went out and did it. But secondarily, noting the fact that it oftentimes uh, necessitated higher operational costs, meant that you only did it at the point at which you could do it at scale, meaning that you did it if you were a big company that already has shelves, shelf space in supermarkets. That was the reason for why they didn't incentivize incentivize new people to come into the market. I would secondly, though, that they probably don't incentivize people to purchase. Not an incredibly reductive conception of how purchasing decisions are made is not realistic. I wish I could go into a supermarket and just pick out everything that made me feel good, but obviously people have more material, proximate concerns of how much they are able to actually afford. Probably that is what takes precedence in those instances. I don't think this is an actually salient way to do this. Okay, that was the extension from CO. What, else, what did we get from OO and why uh, was that just not kind of going to win over our analysis? They tell you, uh, this is their first really, really uh, big and ambitious claim, which was to say that now you cause an economic downturn. I think that was firstly contingent on an outsized characterization of the actual political capacity of these movements, which is to say that Greta Thunberg cannot make an Instagram post and cause a recession. Obviously, there was some limitation and the unreasonable characterization we get there just isn't particularly persuasive. But I think that secondly, uh, note the fact that even if we're going to engage with the scale that we get in the characterization from OO, note the fact that oftentimes it's probably a good thing for the economy insofar as we are currently experiencing inflationary crises globally. I think this actually gives you some degree of credence as an environmental movement insofar as the oftentimes the criticism that is levied against you is that you are economically unrealistic insofar as you are able to coalesce with dominant and legitimate narratives on the economy to say that actually stop spending. That probably makes you uh, more insulated from those criticisms. Next in this debate about political capital and what changes. Uh, I would just note really, really importantly, importantly that the material and responses 
cases thus far, that we get to the claim that you can still call out greenwashing insofar as it isn't part of your imperatives as an environmental organization, you just don't endorse individual companies or promote specific types of products, is incredibly important. And the responses that we get to it, absolutely four. What do we hear in response? Firstly, we get a flippant POI response uh, at OO, which is to say that no, actually, people don't think you as think you have biases. Uh, just gut check this, right? If a company is being paid by one company and then it tells you not to buy the other company, presumably that discount the material or the extent to which you are willing to buy that kind of uh, advocacy. But I think the second important point here, and this is kind of weighing out the other points about political capital compared to other forms of capital, this is the backlash analysis. Will big companies fund you? Is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? I'm going to directly weigh why it is that political support and being able to form coalitions with labor movements, other people on the left, was more materially significant than any amount of corporate support that they got under their side. The first thing to note was the material that comes out at Amanda, which is to say that you have activist funds and investors that are going to give cap uh, charities as well that give capital to these organizations for the advocacy that they do. I think that at the point at which they perceive that you are uh, caught, captured by corporate interests, they are less likely to choose you uh, and less likely to do that in those instances. Uh, Pio, oh, oh, I'll take you in a second, relax. Uh, I think that the second thing that's important to note though, is that your competitors within that industry likely to spread at you, irrespective of whether or not you like target all of them or target one. I think that if it is the case you like promote PNG, other companies are probably likely to target you and discredit you as a means of uh, targeting people who they want to take market share from. Those are reasons for why that's likely to be static. I'll take a POI from opening. Uh, if you do succeed at persuading people, you cause a recession, which leads to job loss, which means it's harder to spend stuff on renewable energy, which is bad for the environment. So I asked you the question, do you succeed? Okay. The extent to which people stop spending and the extent of anti-consumerism is saying, don't buy that new iPhone. It's shit. Nothing has changed. It's not telling people to literally stop purchasing and to die in their homes of cold and exposure. Like that was the actual problem with your characterization. Uh, but next, in terms of weighing corporate support versus political coalitions, note the fact that thirdly, any degree of political action, all the things I talk about, about like uh, having reforms about increased regulation or increased sustainability, necessitated some degree of backlash. All of those things were obviously going to be symmetric for the reasons that I highlight to you, because competitors have an incentive to discredit you, because secondly, they already probably hate you in and of itself, compare that to labor movements, compare that to being able to have activist investors and funds that give you capital directly to be able to achieve your ambitions. You still get capital under our side of the house. You still have legitimacy under our side of the house. Labor movements that don't think that you are like in bed with their employer likely do things like coalesce the political capital around you. They likely advocate for the same politicians you do, lowering the amount of cost you have to do for those things. They likely lend you credence in ways that's incredibly important. I think lastly, just in terms of how intuitive it is, note the fact that it is incredibly intuitive messaging. It's not about like like giving people marks to read. It's just saying, don't buy the new iPhone, don't engage in excess forms of consumerism. We extensively challenge the absurd characterization that comes out of opening. By the extension at Amanda, give us the one. You're here. Thank you for that speech. To end the debate, I welcome the opposition whip. You're here. Hey, hi. Uh, POI is in the chat, please. Okay, um, stop. Starting my speech in three, two, one. First, let me deal with closing government. Three things closing government brings up. First is the characterization of environmental movement, that it's poor, it has it is uh, like very poor capital to begin with. And second, it's talking about the winning the sport of young people. And third is about, I think it was about empowering poor people or something which came in like last like one minute of um, a member of government. Let's respond to the first point about character of environmental movement and why this is going, uh, you know, it, the fact that it has extremely limited possibility. I think that this might hit OO, but it does not hit closing, clearly does not hit closing opposition because we prove why environmental movement uniquely has more capacity on our side of the house by getting corporate support, by gaining, uh, by incentivizing corporations to actually support you by hacking the system of capitalism, hacking the system of corporate in incentives. I think this is the nuance that I think closing government clearly misses. I think that the comparative we have to talk about on opposition government side of the house is the world in which environmental movements have significantly less capacity. There is no corporate support because there is literally no incentive for any corporation to support you if it's not going to be lucrative. It's not going to be a business model. That's why, for example, 
corporations are more likely to support like defamation, uh, uh, like a discrediting um environmental movements, like for example, supporting the quote unquote scientist petition against that, like doubting climate change, etc., or like you know making the media ex report on exclusively radical, exclusively crazy environmental activists that actually you know damage the credibility of the environmental movement as a whole, or also I think that corporations just just, just you know are more likely to draw like all extract all of the sponsorship that they had they're more likely to for example support conservative politicians the opposition the government world that they have to respond it's all as is also pointed out clearly by the poi from opening opposition is a world in which the environmental movement literally cannot do anything so even if cog wants to say that our world is going to be tokenistic it's just comparatively far better because comparatively the comparative is none uh, okay, second is that young people uh, on young people do not resonate with anti-consumerism. I have a couple of responses here. A, I think that young people are often exposed to ads or like beauty standards of corporations on, on your train to your school or on your Instagram reels or on a daily basis. It's very difficult to see, uh, think that young people are actually inherently anti-consumerist. We think that they have incentive to actually buy. But B, I think that they are an, at an age in which they will, for example, want to express themselves. That's why um, the majority of fashion consumption comes from the younger generation. Let's see. I think that the vast majority of these people, like the parents are employed by these capitalist institutions that, for example, sh sell shoes that you know, their parents make or the clothes that their parents make. I think all of these things mean that it's, they're unlikely to be, you know, anti-capitalist, anti as which is an extremely unrealistic characterization coming from closing government. Uh, but the fourth thing that I, I will note here is that it's clearly in tension with the government characterization in which people generally have a trend to uh, advocate for environmental movement or are they going to, uh, they have a trend to be like anti-consumers? I, I really do not see why they are likely to re reject green products. If it is the case that they resonate with environmental movement, they are probably going to resonate with us as well. Um, Okay, and then the, the final concern that they had is that it's going to be an extremely expensive product. I think that you can just ch charge premiums for those products uh, so that rich people can only buy. There are multiple, uh, so, uh, you know, mechanisms to actually prevent this from happening, like, ta uh, um, like for example, uh, systems in like taxation, etc. So we would say that probably this is not a huge problem. The assertion, I think that the fact that in green products are always going to be expensive is just an assertion. The final thing I want to talk about is, you know, production of anything is bad. Uh, which comes from both opening and closing government. Uh, and they talk about, you know, carbon waste or tokenistic. The more green products are produced, the, the more the environment is damaged. Okay, first, green products are environmentally friendly. If you've read the info site, they disintegrate, for example, disintegrating plastic or like, the, you know, straws that do not emit like carbon in their production process. We, we, we really do not see why the, the increase of green products is going to be bad if... Uh, just by this mechanism. But second, I think that there are multiple monitoring mechanisms exist. For example, disclosing uh, which, uh, which, like disclosing chemical composition on the product's labels is, is actually a legal obligation or like financial security reports in which company corporations are, are obligated to actually write about all of the ESG things that they've been doing or governmental bodies composed of experts like the Ministry of Environment or like if, um, at least exists in my country. I think that all of these monitoring mechanisms are probably going to exist either way. The third the overconsumption is going to be worse in government side of the world at the point where the environment movement has significantly less capital, significantly less me media power, and people are just going to be, you know, more likely to be swayed and more likely to be influenced by the corporate messaging that corporations are able to, you know, wield on their side of the house with all of the capital that they would have otherwise used to support ESG movements. I'll take a POI from opening. At the end of the day, the poor still can't be afford to be sustainable and green products become mere political decorations for the rich. It doesn't do anything. People still overconsume, which is what causes the damage. Why would the environmental movement let that happen? Um, no, I, I, I think I think there's a misunderstanding of our uh, of our extension. Our extension is to say that on your world, green environmental movements to begin with are not going to have any capacity to begin meaningful capacity. They just have to compete with the corporations and just be over who just have so much more capital, have so much media capacity to actually wipe out all of the environmental campaigns that, that you could have done, which are on our side of the house. OK, so let's find let's talk about OG. Uh, OG talks about, you know, uh, mainly two things. First, uh, about the saturation of green product is going to be bad. It's not going to be accessible to poor people on the ground. What we would say is that number one, green products can easily exist in developing economies as well. We think that R&D is happening, which means that the price is actually being pulled down, but also local agri product, agricultural products are necessarily environmental friendly. I don't see why this is actually the case. The second, if people are so poor 
And anti-consumerism is just going to be a far more damaging um, thing for these people, right? That, because there's less production. That means that there's more, let, more cuts in businesses, like less supermarkets in your town, which is a much more serious issue for the daily sustenance of these people. I really do not see why anti-consumerism is going to help poor people. But second... And then they say it's going to be like, you know, uh, the second thing they say it's going to be uh, this, the narrative is going to be less uh, persuasive because it's, they say that it's going to make economic sense. But I think people would already do this. People already think about, you know, whether their expenditure or income is, you know, you know, matching uh, like on a monthly basis. I really do not see why people are not doing this in the status quo. The difference emerges in context in which people have some level of financial capacity. And this is the context that we have to talk about. I think the opening a government's context is largely asymmetric and therefore irrelevant. Okay, finally, opening opposition. I think all of all of my material proves that it's probably uh, an op op win, but still, I will differentiate with opposition, opposition nevertheless. First, we prove the efficacy and impacting of gaining corporate support to begin with. We prove why sponsoring is inclusive and why the comparative is no support. We better explain the political support mechanism that O, o brings up, or people being inter internally persuaded. Political support or people's feelings are speculative. Ours is certain. Money is the prerequisite for environmental movement to sustain. Uh, so yeah, just calling out the obvious misrepresentation should come from government with. Second, I think that our mechanism is not contingent on the radical characterization of anti-consumerism, which opening opposition necessarily is contingent on, um, noting the issue brought up from closing government. So for, we think that all on, on all of those grounds, it's a closing opposition win. You're here. Thank you for that speech and thank you everyone for that debate. Uh, please virtually cross floor, shake hands and leave the room so the adjudicators can deliberate. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good Thanks round. Everyone. Hi, if everyone who's not an adjudicator could just leave, please. Thank you. Um, hi, Supe, are you there? Lidwin, can you hear me speaking? Uh, I don't think Denise is here either. Yeah, yeah. can we get uh, um, from the Ocom to remove Denise? And stop the recording. Or we can also move to Discord. Yeah, works as well. Uh, sure, okay. Uh, which Discord room? Uh, room two, maybe. But I think other people can join as well, even if we're in there. So I'm not sure. I think the de deliberation room is locked. Yeah, the deliberation room is locked for educators only, if I'm correct. Okay, cool. Then room two to the 